Uh, today, what I'm going to do is talk about a 10 year perspective on healthy seagrass in Geograph Bay. So, some of you may be, have a really good understanding of seagrasses, especially some of my family members who are here and have been exposed to it for many decades. Um, but seagrasses are flowering plants. There's about 70 species worldwide and they actually evolved from the land and they reinvaded the sea and they live in the shallow coastal zones. And they evolved about 60 million years ago. So they're really different to seaweeds or algae, um, where there's thousands of species, and these have been around for 3.5 billion years ago. Um, and they can live in much deeper water than seagrasses. So seagrasses, they do awesome things. They protect our coastlines from erosion, they clean our seawater by filtering out nutrients and bacteria. Um, they feed many animals and provide a home for many creatures. And they also capture carbon, which is really significant um, in this, where we are today with climate change and the increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and the warming temperatures. And they're really globally significant at capturing carbon. If you look at the, the graph, um, the low bars are the amount of um, carbon that forests can capture. And this is the amount of carbon that seagrass, mangroves, and salt marsh can capture. So it's a much larger scale of carbon capture, so they're much more effective at it. And they do that by storing it in the sediments um, underneath the living material. And you might have heard Scott Morrison talking recently about one of the new plans for Australia is soil carbon capture. Well, this is also happening in the environment. And the federal government are developing policies to account for that carbon that these marine habitats can capture. So, why do we care about trapping carbon? Well, I think we're all quite aware of that after COP26 with the increasing CO2 concentrations resulting in global warming. And even if we actually um, meet these targets that um, governments have set to become net zero and reduce the carbon dioxide emissions, the carbon dioxide concentration um, emissions will go down, but there'll still be this amount that's in the atmosphere that we need to pull out of the atmosphere to reduce warming, and it's some of the, one of the ways to do that is through nature-based solutions, and seagrasses can do that. So, what happens when we lose seagrasses? So, in 2011, there was a heat wave in Western Australia, and we actually lost a huge area um, of seagrass in Shark Bay, which is a World Heritage area, in these red areas here. And there was estimates done that by losing that seagrass and all the carbon that was trapped under it, under it, it released about 4 to 11% of Australia's annual CO2 emissions. So, really significant. So, hopefully I've demonstrated to you the importance of seagrass, and now I'm going to talk about what's happening with the seagrasses in Geograph Bay. So we often monitor seagrasses because they're really sensitive to environmental change and they're good indicators of ecosystem health and um, do respond to nutrient enrichment, which is a concern um, in the waterways around Bustleton and the catchment of Geograph Bay. Um, so Geograph Bay and the catchment has been identified as a national eutrophication hotspot and many government agencies in Geocatch have been doing fantastic work to reduce those nutrient loads coming into our waterways. But the predictions are that they are still going to increase and we do see um, negative impacts in the waterways. But we didn't have a good indicator of what was happening in the marine environment. And this is where the um, Keep Watch program um, was set up. And it was set up in 2012 to um, identify a marine indicator to link the threat of um, catchment nutrients. Um, and there was a clear objective as trying to understand is the seagrass declining, because we don't want it to decline. And it needed to be repeatable so we could do it every year and if we, um, so we could detect if there was change or decline. And we used a similar approach to other places in southwestern Australia. 
And we have a, a trigger system which identifies if we, if we think there's a concern in seagrass decline. And it also needed to be cost effective. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey. I started um, on this in 2011 where with the Southwest Catchment Council, Water Corp, Fisheries, uh, Parks and Wildlife at the time, and Geocatch, um, who received funding from um, NRM to develop this program. And then you can see over time, there's been multiple people involved. Um, Geocatch and ECU, um, Water Corp started funding it from 2014. Um, Department of Fisheries provided the boats. And then when um, the Nagari Capes Marine Park was announced, the Marine Park Rangers came on board as well and we have this collaborative arrangement. <clears throat> so we have seven sites, or eight sites in Geograph Bay that we call the Keep Watch sites, from Dunsborough around to Forest Beach. And we also do some monitoring up in Capel, where the main seagrass that we look at, Posidonia sinuosa, is not very common up there, but we look at another species to understand um, the nutrient concentrations. So most of the sites are in the Nagari Capes Marine Park, except for the Forest Beach in Capel. So every summer from January to February, um, we go out and we monitor the health of the seagrass, and we do this by counting the number of shoots of the Posidonia seagrass and we also look at the algal cover and the amount of nutrients and sources of nutrients in the seagrass themselves and assess whether it changes over time. So just to show you what it looks like underwater, these are the Geograph Bay seagrass meadows. This was in January this year. And what we do is we go underwater, there's a, a picket, you can just see in the corner there, someone's put their hand on it, and we run these transect tapes out, and then along the transect tapes we put these square quadrats down, um, and we put our head down into the grass, and we count the number of shoots. And it usually takes um, five up to 15 minutes to count one. At each side, we have a number of divers doing this, and then we come up with the numbers. And what we've found over the last 10 years is that the seagrass meadows, based on the management guidelines that we have, are healthy, and there's no, no triggers have been uh, triggered and or no indication of poor health. So the way that we do that, the trigger one, we get concerned if the, the amount, amount of shoots drops by about 50%. And every year from 2012 up into this year, this hasn't occurred. You can see that there are changes um, from one year to the next, some declines and then some increases. The second trigger, which we get concerned about, is if it drops by 20% in one year and then continues into the second year. So a number of years we've had some declines of 20%, but the next year it's either stayed the same or gone back up. The third one is that over a five year period, if there's just a consistent like, decline, a more slower decline, then once again, that has, hasn't happened at all over the 12 year period. So it's looking, it's looking really good. One thing that we look at is the amount of epiphytes. And so this is a scale from one, like very low, up to five, very high, and you can see that in the centre of the bay, between the Bay and Up and Bustleton Jetty, that's where we tend to see the highest amount of algal cover. It fluctuates over the year, but um, recently we can see consistently it's been high cover. So that is a little bit of a concern, so we need to keep our eye on that. High cover of algae for a long period of time can result in a decline in seagrass, but we're not seeing that decline but we're sort of seeing um, a little bit of um, algal epiphyte here that we just need to keep our eye on. So when we look at the nutrient content, we actually grab some seagrass, we take it back to the lab, we dry it and we analyse it um, to look at the amount of nitrogen and the amount of phosphorus in the um, seagrass tissue. So seagrasses can take up more nutrients than they actually need. So if they're 
exposed to more, if more is released into the environment, they'll just take it up, they'll just hold it there um, until they can grow and they'll use it for growth. Um, but what we find in Geograph Bay are really, really low concentrations of nutrients in the tissue, usually less than 1%. Um, and not really any major changes over time. Like 2014 was slightly higher than the other years. And sort of no consistent pattern between the sites. One interesting thing though is I told you that we looked at the nutrients um, in the seagrass at Capel. This is a different seagrass, it's amphibolous um, because that's the main one that grows um, around Capel and also occurs in patches throughout um, Geograph Bay, but not as common as Posidonia. So when we first started sampling, you can see that this is the nitrogen in the seagrass tissues at Capel. It was quite a bit higher um, than the sites in Geograph Bay. Um, and that sort of fluctuated and peaked a bit in 2020 and it dropped back down in 2021. So that indicates that the seagrasses at Capel are exposed to higher concentrations of nutrients probably coming out of the capal drain. Still not excessive, um, but certainly higher than Geograph Bay. And also another thing that we look at is the isotopes of nitrogen, the ratio of nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15, which are just two different forms of nitrogen. And this ratio can give us a bit of an indication of where the nutrient, the nitrogen is coming from where if it's close to zero, it's predominantly either from agriculture or chemical fertilizers or fixation of nitrogen gas. Um, or two to five is often native bushland, six to eight is often um, predominantly animal waste or from septic tanks, and nine can be the treated wastewater. So you can see at Cable there's also the um, isotope ratio is quite different to the rest of the sites in Geograph Bay. So it is um, receiving different sources of nutrients there and it, it's most likely a combination of sort of native bushland, maybe some um, animal and septic waste that's bringing it up, but predominantly um, the, the first two categories of nitrogen sources. So I'm not sure how I'm going with time. I've got seven minutes, so I've got five minutes. Um, so to wrap it all up, um, over the, this 10 years of monitoring in Geograph Bay, um, the seagrass meadows, uh, based on um, the method that we use, are indicating that they're quite stable um, and they're healthy. Um, the shoot densities, so the, the sh counts that we do, they're actually in the upper range, so the highest that we see in um, the southwest of WA. So these programs also occur near Perth in Shoalwater Bay and Coburn Sound and also in Durian Bay where we have similar species in the marine parks there. And Geograph Bay is the, the highest density. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, what is, um, just uh, so you're aware, in Durian Bay and Coburn Sound we have been seeing um, some declines over the last five years and the hypothesis is that it's related to warming. Um, so that's something to sort of a, a threat into the future that we need to consider about how warming is going to um, affect the seagrasses. So currently um, what we're seeing in terms of change is it's not too concerning. We are seeing some algal cover varying over time um, higher in the centre of the bay, but that's also the most protected part of the bay. So you would expect that it, it would accumulate um, more there and not get washed away by waves. Um, and the nutrient content is is really low, so that's not a concern here either. And we're seeing nitrogen from a range of sources. So looking forward, um, recommendations for the future. Um, certainly continuing these management measures to reduce nutrient loads um, because it is still a potential threat though we haven't seen it realised at all in the last 10 years in, in the Geograph Bay. Um, to continue monitoring um, and work with all the, the key stakeholders that are interested in the in these seagrass meadows. And when we do the shoot counts we're actually we're just looking at how 
seven sites, right? So we're not looking across the whole bay. So it's really useful to sort of use a hierarchical approach where you can take some indicators at particular sites and then create a map which is a higher level to see if we're seeing change um, outside of these sites. Um, so this is actually happening this summer with the um, DBCA and, and Geocatch and working on creating that map for the, the near shore seagrass meadows, so that's fantastic. And then based on what we're seeing further north, um, temperature is definitely a threat and it's something we need to think about um, in terms of can we build resilience into these um, seagrass meadows um, into the future. So that's all from me. Um, just like to thank the huge number of people that have been involved over the 10 years, obviously all these different organisations and um, the DBCA ranges, the Geocatch staff, um, the funding from Waterfork and Fisheries. So yeah, it's been a huge, huge effort from a, a huge number of people um, to 